Um, well, it's a real pleasure to have this trio with us today. Um, for, for those of, you know, there are many of us who have um, had the pleasure of watching the larger Exit Zero project, which includes a book, a uh, documentary film, and the project that we'll be seeing today um, develop over the last few years. And, and um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's just exciting to see what um, this, this new part, um, how it's been developing over the last year, especially. Um, I, I will go ahead and just introduce everyone and then I'll, I'll hand it over to, to the three of you. Um, so uh, Jeff Soik is an award-winning media artist with credits as creative director and UI UX designer on PBS Frontline's Inheritance, um, which was a 2016 News and Documentary Emmy winner, winner and a Peabody Facebook Award winner, um, as well as art director, UI UX designer, and architect on Hollow, um, which was a, also a Peabody Award winner in 2013 and a News and Documentary Emmy nominee, and was really, you know, one of the the, the first projects to really show what was possible with um, interactive documentary. Um, and really kind of set a, a sort of high bar early on in, in the development of, of that uh, genre. Um, Chris Wally is a professor of anthropology at MIT. She is the award-winning author of Exit Zero, Family and Class in Post-Industrial Chicago, um, which was on University of Chicago Press in 2013 and a co-creator of a documentary film, Exit Zero, An Industrial Family Story, 2017. Uh, Chris Babel is Director of Media and Development at MIT Open Learning, where he oversees media production for professional education and explores the uses of media in education, including VR and interactive media. A filmmaker by training, he has produced and directed feature films, documentaries, and television. His work has been shown on many networks around the world, including PBS and the BBC, and at more than 50 film festivals, including Sundance. Um, I will hand it over to the three of you. Welcome. Great, thank you all so much, and thank you, Vivek, for the invitation um, to come speak to Comparative Media Studies Colloquium. Um, with Vivek, we, Chris and I have been in conversation for many, many years because our, our projects, um, our work across different media has been ongoing um, for a long time. So it's been wonderful to be in conversation um, this whole time. And so thank you so much for the chance for us to come and tell you a little bit about this latest project that we're working on. Um, since you've already kind of gotten quick introductions about who we all are, um, maybe we'll just kind of hop into things. Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, a project we've been working on for a number of years now called the Southeast Chicago Archive and Storytelling Project. Um, and the way we were thinking that we would organize um, the, the discussion and demonstration today is that as the project director, I'll give a bit of an overview of the project. Um, and then we're going to kind of take you through, um, do a demo of the site. Um, the site's not fully completed. We're hoping to do our official launch um, in the next month or two. Um, but we'll, we'll um, Chris and Jeff will lead you through um, the project. We'll go back and forth um, and talk more about um, the larger overarching ideas as well. Um, and hopefully leave a lot of time for the Q&A and discussion at the end because we're really um, interested to hear what you all make of this. And again, because we're, we still haven't officially launched yet, we still have a chance to, um, you know, take in feedback and um, make some tweaks. So we would love to hear what you all think. Okay, so just to hop in. So this website project is a collab collaboration on many different levels. On um, one level, it's a collaboration among ourselves, Chris, Jeff, and myself, um, as well as a large and growing team of folks who've been involved in this. Um, and I don't know, I think Jeff is doing the slides. If there's an, another slide, we have two um, that lays out some of the folks who've been involved um, in this project. Um, and there's been quite a number who've developed over the last how many years we've been working on this since 2004 um, in various different stages. Um, so there's, there's the, the kind of creative team and academic team who's been working on it, the three of us. We also have um, an archivist, 
um, a couple tech developers. We have advisory committee um, and a range of other folks who've done various things for the project. But the biggest sense in which it's a collaboration is with the Southeast Chicago Historical Museum. Um, so what this is, it's a, it's a little tiny museum um, in Southeast Chicago. Um, and um, basically the museum um, was created in the mid 1980s. Um, Southeast Chicago is part of the Calumet region, which along with Southeast Chicago and Northwest Indiana is kind of the old steel belt region in that area. And the steel mills started closing in the 1980s. And around that time that the steel mills were closing, this little museum was created. So it's an all volunteer museum. Um, it's located in one room in a park field house along Lake Michigan. Um, it doesn't have a phone, much less the internet. Um, it's, you know, we, in some ways we think of it as kind of like the community attic of Southeast Chicago. Um, so it's an all volunteer run institution and it's been that way for 40 years now, um, basically. Um, so with this little community museum, as the steel mill started to close, I mean, I think basically what happened was that a lot of people who lived in Southeast Chicago, um, who kind of felt as the steel mills were closing, not only that they were losing their economic livelihoods, but that also the, the, their history um, and the kind of social worlds in which they had grown up were disappearing. And so I think there was a real sense among a lot of people of wanting to, um, you know, hold on to or preserve or do something with um, the kind of materials of the past that they had um, um, as part of their lives and make sure that that continued or was recognized in some way. So there was a lot of donation of material that happened in um, the 80s and on from this region for people in the community themselves. Um, and just to tell you a little bit more about, um, tell you a little bit more about the community. Um, so historically, Southeast Chicago, with the rise of the steel industry in the late 1890s, a lot of the folks who came to live there were European immigrants who came to work in the steel mills, a lot of Eastern European immigrants. Um, around World War I, you started to get a lot of African Americans who were also coming to work in the steel mills as well as Mexican Americans. So it's a quite diverse region and it's been that way historically um, from some time. Um, so I think we also have um, some video of the museum itself just to give you a little, a little taste of what the museum is like. So this, <laughs> this is, <laughs> Um, so this is the museum, as you can see, again, it's one room really overstuffed with, um, with things. Um, it's a pretty unique place. It has a really remarkable collection. Um, if we're getting some video lag, maybe I'll um, turn off my video. Maybe that'll help. I'm not sure if that'll help with the lag, but anyway. Um, so it's a really kind of unique place. There's a re remarkable wealth of material in here. Um, there's about 180 oral histories that dating back to the 1970s. There's about 10,000 images in the museum, about 350 pieces of film or video, about 250 pieces of clothing, countless documents and other materials. Um, and there's really not anything else like this place that I know of. I mean, as a scholar who works on deindustrialization um, on former industrial regions in different parts of the U.S., um, there's not really anything else like this, a kind of collection of this much material that basically came out of the community itself where the materials were donated by people in the area. Um, and if anybody's interested, it's a good question for the Q and A, how is it kind of, how did this uh, museum emerge and how did it end up with such an incredible collection over time? Um, but, you know, even though it's a pretty amazing um, institution in a lot of ways, um, you, you know, again, because it's an all volunteer institution, it's only open one day um, a week. Um, it's considered to be in a very out of the way place within um, Chicago. It's very difficult for people to get there. There's no public transportation there. Um, and Chris and I started working um, with the museum for a, a book and documentary film um, about the region, which, which Vivek mentioned, um, Exit Zero. Exit Zero is the highway um, exit ramp number for the old Southeast Chicago steel mill neighborhoods. Um, and those works were more autoethnographic. I grew up in Southeast Chicago. My father had been a steel worker. Many of my relatives had been steel workers. Um, and so um, that original work kind of took that more kind of family oriented as well as academic analysis to the area. And with this project, we were really trying to kind of spread it out and do something different, which you'll, you'll see as we go, um, as we go along. Um, but so we got the idea to collaborate with the museum in part through CMS's Open Doc Lab. 
Um, so actually when Chris and I were working on the documentary film um, and in conversation with um, William Arricchio um, and Sarah um, at the Open Doc Lab, um, you know, they're saying, well, you know, is there anything about the research? You should do something, you know, kind of IDOC related um, in relation to your research. And I was like, well, I don't know about that, but there's this amazing museum that Chris and I have been working with. Um, and that actually was the original um, impetus um, to do this project. And then we got hooked up with Jeff, who has been a fellow at the Open Doc Lab. Um, we knew about Jeff's fantastic work with Hollow, the, the um, interactive documentary that, that Vivek mentioned, um, which was a kind of groundbreaking early um, one for those of you who are familiar with and a really fantastic piece of work. Um, and so we started working on this project back in 2003, 2004. Um, and as the name suggests, um, Southeast Chicago Archive and Storytelling Project is really meant to be the project that we're creating now. Um, the website is really meant to be both an online archive and a storytelling sense, um, site with a somewhat unique take on both of those, as hopefully we'll, we'll demonstrate. But I just wanted to quickly tell you some of the larger goals around the project, um, which we had going into this. And so those larger goals have been threefold. Um, first of all, one of the things that's quite important to me as an anthropologist and somebody also who's from Southeast Chicago was to show the diversity and the multifaceted nature of working class lives, right? So if in the kind of the Trump era, the rhetoric around the working class, quote unquote, has been to resurrect this notion of the white, of the working class as kind of white male industrial workers. I mean, what this archive really does is show that not only is that not the case now, that also wasn't the case in the past. Um, <laughs> folks in these industrial communities were very diverse, um, um, there was a lot of diversity from early on um, in racial, ethnic, um, gender, and other terms. Um, and so we we're really trying to capture some um, of that kind of diversity of what the working class, quote unquote, is and has been historically. Um, and that doesn't mean that there weren't very serious tensions within this region. There were certainly along racial and ethnic lines, um, in part because in the old um, steel mills, the, the steel mill management pitted, very much pitted ethnic and racial groups against each other. Um, in order to decrease unionization. Um, so they're very real tensions. And one of the things we try to do is bring some of those tensions into the website itself, um, as you'll see. But we also wanted to, to highlight how the museum and the material really kind of offers a more multifaceted view again of quote unquote working class um, lives and history. So the materials in the museum not only focus on um, the steel mills or on work, but also people's social and cultural lives, um, popular culture, games, music. Um, and we also try to show, um, and what the materials themselves really um, demonstrate, in which we try to kind of capitalize on, is that these kind of old communities, they also had very different kinds of strains within those communities. So both quite conservative institutions and quite progressive institutions, in other case, cases, both kind of intertwined in, the, in, uh, in these communities. And so we're really trying to capture this kind of more multifaceted view um, of working class history. And secondly, another goal of the project, um, what we're really trying to do is use objects that people in the region themselves saved and the stories that people told themselves about those objects to generate interest in working class lives and kind of all its ethnic, racial, and gender diversity. Um, and so this project is very much a kind of anthro take on archives. So there's a real kind of fascination with kind of what people saved from the past. So what did people donate to this museum? Why did they donate it? Why was it important to them? What were the stories that people told through and about these objects? Um, and what kinds of conceptions of history emerged from this kind of storytelling around objects? And the themes and the categories we use to organize the website largely emerged from the museum collection itself and the way that the volunteers from the community themselves organized um, the museum. So for example, um, there's one featured curation um, on um, kind of military experiences, we call it on the home front. Um, and you know, thinking about, the military is not something I would have come in thinking about as an issue, um, but there was a lot of material in this museum on people's experiences, either um, people who had been in the military themselves or people on the home front and what that experience was like for them. So that ends up, um, you know, being kind of one of the focuses um, there. So again, we try to really draw the themes and the categories from the website from what's actually in the museum itself. Um, and there's often this kind of cliche about bringing history to life. Um, but I really do think that telling history through objects um, really gives a more kind of lively sense of everyday life and the pleasures and struggles of people's lives than many other ways of telling history. Um, and I think this is particularly key given that many of the issues represented in the museum's collections 
really speak, speak to key issues in our, current, in our current historical moment as well. So things like the nature of work, issues of police brutality, ethnic and racial conflict, controlled by powerful corporate actors. Um, you really see all of these kinds of issues in the materials from the museum um, and how people, um, how this played out for people um, historically in this kind of region. And a third goal of the project is to expand out our sense of who the audience is. So with this project, we're really trying for multiple audiences. Obviously, we'd like the general public to be interested. We hope to attract teachers and students. We're actually working on a study guide um, to accompany this project. Um, we want scholars to be able to use it. But really, the first audience in many ways is people in the community itself and in other deindustrialized um, regions like it. Um, and so given my own background, I've been very concerned about being able to interface with working class audiences, um, particularly since for many people in regions like this, um, legit news is often behind paywalls. Um, local newspapers have been decimated. This area actually has the oldest community newspaper in the United States, was in Southeast Chicago, um, which has been down now for some time. There's no more local paid newspapers that are left. And also disinvestment in public education. And so given this, people in the area themselves don't necessarily know a lot about their own histories often um, and how relevant the issues that their forebears struggled with, um, how relevant they are to a lot of contemporary issues. Um, and so we really wanted to engage with um, diverse working class audiences who have links to this region or kind of other deindustrialized ones and to do it on a train generated by community residents themselves, again, through the objects they saved and the saved and the stories they told about them. Um, so one of the goals of the project for me anyway is, is to really think about how to reflect back working class history for working class audiences of diverse backgrounds who really don't necessarily get a lot of that reflection back um, in many domains today. And part of this goal is to use these material to create bridges for intergenerational conversation. So there's a scholar, Martha Langford, who's argued that photo albums, she thinks of them not so much as pictorial technologies, but as oral ones. And she argues like, if you think about albums, photo albums, family photo albums, and how people actually use them, um, they, you know, they pass them around, they talk to people, you know, you'd sit down on the couch and you'd chat with family members about what was going on and the other people who were, who were depicted in the photographs. And she really sees them as conversational objects that were mnemonic devices to help people remember. Um, and so, um, so, so there was conversation built into those kinds of albums. And then she argues that when albums got put into museums, often the conversations at the heart of those albums were suspended. And I was presenting on this work at a conference not too long ago and a colleague said, oh, what you're trying to do in this project is reanimate those suspended conversations. Um, and in some case, in some ways to engage in a kind of intergenerational repair work, which I think is a really lovely way to, to do it. So how do we take these objects that people in a community saved and the stories around those and use those to regenerate conversation that had been there in the past and kind of reanimate those links between different um, generations? Because for a lot of younger folks, they don't know much of this um, history themselves. So just quickly to mention a couple challenges before I hand it off to Chris and to Jeff. So a couple of the challenges we faced in putting together this archive and storytelling project. Um, so number one, because again, this is a tiny all volunteer institution, again, a bit more like a community attic in some ways than a formal museum. Um, there's been no professional archivist um, historically. So record taking, taking was really erratic. So um, different volunteers had different numbering systems. A lot of stuff was never um, cataloged at all. Sometimes you had handwritten records. Um, so it was really hard to even know what all was in the museum or how to find it, um, even for the museums, that, uh, museum volunteers themselves who'd been working there for decades in some cases. And so when I was working on the first NEH grant for this back in 2013, we needed to know how, many, how much was in the film and video collection because we wanted to ask for money to digitize it, but nobody knew. So I like literally spent like one day just counting, <laughs> counting VHS tapes, you know, and then you'd go to a file cabinet and pull out another drawer and it'd be like, oh my God, there's like six more 16 millimeter, you know, reels of film here. Or, you know, so, so at the beginning, it was simply just an, also a matter of just counting things, figuring out what was actually in the museum. Um, and then later we got money to, um, when we got the NEH money, the first thing we did was hire a part-time archivist, um, Derek Potts, who's been fabulous. Um, and he's helped to take these records and put them in an online um, database 
and also to help systematize the records of what was there and create ones for ones that didn't have records. So for the first time now, you know, not only um, for us, but also for the volunteers at the museum, they can actually see what's in the museum. And one of the things that's been very cool about that is, as you can see things and track now who's the donors, we can see how the different objects are linked. Because often people, different family members across generations often donated things. So you can put together now different donations and figure out how, how family members were, were related or linked together stories. So it's actually been really um, fantastically useful. Um, so just figuring out what's there took three, three or more years of work to be able to do that. Um, a second major challenge that we've had, and this is true for all, obviously, all archival collections, um, is thinking about the silences and gaps in the archives. So in this particular case, um, for Southeast Chicago, there's four neighborhoods that are considered to be part of Southeast Chicago. Um, there was a historical society founded in 1976 in one of those neighborhoods, and that was largely a white ethnic neighborhood. Um, and, and that group was one of the kind of founding, group, founding groups. Um, but then the ex project expanded out to four other neighborhoods, which were more diverse in, in, um, in racial um, and ethnic terms. Um, but because of that kind of early history, and also because you didn't see African Americans and Mexican Americans in the area until World War I, there's still a disproportionate amount of material on white ethnics, largely Eastern, Euro um, Eastern Europeans. Um, and another issue that, that came up also is because of housing discrimination and racism, even though you had a lot of African Americans who worked in the steel mills, um, and there's a lot of material on African Americans in union history and in the steel mills here, but because of that housing discrimination, they often didn't live in Southeast um, Chicago until later decades. They often lived in other parts of the city um, and took public transportation. In. So for example, we have a lot of material, again, on African-Americans in the unions, but for example, African-American businesses, there's, there's very little on that, for example. So how to deal with that kind of gap in the collection. So that was, so what were the kind of gaps and the silences in this co collection and how would we handle that was another real challenge. Um, and then the last challenge I wanted to throw out um, was this question of how to get people excited and interested in a place like this. Um, thinking about something like labor or industrial history or working class culture, um, something like labor history, people often know very little about it um, these days. Pretty much in the 1990s, a lot of teaching of that at universities often stopped. Um, at that point, um, even in the media, you don't necessarily, um, you know, kind of discussion about unions is, is coming back, but it, it kind of went out of the picture for a while there. And again, as I mentioned earlier, for a lot of young people, even in this area, um, they really don't have a lot of background to, um, to bring to bear to help understand some of the materials in the collection um, that deal with those kinds of topics. So how do you create ways in um, to this material to allow people to approach the archive? Um, and also on my end, um, I was somewhat frustrated um, with some of the other online archives that I saw elsewhere. Sometimes they were very beautiful, sometimes very expensive, but sometimes they can be hard to approach. So some of the online archives, there might be, for example, a lot of technical information about, oh, here's a particular object, here's its exact measurements, here's the resolution that it was scanned at. But in terms of what do we really know about the object? Why did somebody save it? Who donated it? Why did they care about this? Um, so those kinds of questions often aren't answered in a lot of the archives. Um, and so that was another kind of challenge was how to um, create pathways into this material that would make it engaging for people, would allow them ways to think about how, to, how do you search for stuff? Um, how do you search for stuff if you're not even aware of what you should be looking for? So how do we create pathways in um, when people might not know anything about the area or the kinds of topics that, that might be um, that might be interested. Um, and how do we do this um, in, in a way that makes these materials engaging um, for people through the kind of metadata we're gonna br bring about these archival objects itself. So anyway, so those were some of the challenges and we're gonna be talking a bit later then um, uh, in the talk about how we tried to address those challenges in the website itself. So now I'll hand it off to um, Chris. <laughs> Will excuse the noise in the background. We'll then hand it hand it off to um, to Jeff. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what that was. Um, so I wanted to just say a few words about um, the museum collection itself and storytelling because that's really at the heart of the project. Um, so you know the thing that's really unique, as Chris mentioned, about this collection 
is how it was assembled. It was assembled by community members who basically just donated things that were important to them. Um, so there's not like a lot of, you know, sort of professionalization about it. There's not a professional archivist. Um, it's not really programmatic. It, you know, it's sort of like in, in, in a moment of crisis, this crisis of deindustrialization, which is when, when the museum started, this is what was important to people. This is what people felt they needed to preserve. Um, so that means that there's some pretty quirky items in the archive. Um, and there's, you know, there's a ton of repetition. Um, Chris mentioned some of the organizational challenges. Um, and, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, what some people might call junk, you know, Rod Sellers, who's the really amazing volunteer director of the museum, who has a historian's training, um, and is a local community member and a, a retired teacher, you know, is always warning people like, don't bring your National Geographic magazines. We don't want those, you know, don't, don't bring the contents of your attic. We're not going to sort through for you, you know, what you have. Um, but there are, you know, amazing objects and, and, and some of the objects, you know, some, something that one person might call junk or trash is, of course, precious to someone else. Um, you know, like we have objects like, like these. These are um, baby shoes. They were worn by a resident named Gloria Heinkel Novak, who was born in 1926 to German immigrant parents. Um, she later worked as a secretary to scientists working on the Manhattan Project uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, we have this. This is the last bar of steel that was rolled at Republic Steel in 1986, uh, then called LTV Steel. Um, you know, some, it, this was preserved because the workers at, at the mill, when it was being closed, felt that it was important to them to, to preserve it. Um, you know, we have thousands and thousands of photographs uh, and other documents. These are the Martinez sisters. Uh, this is this really amazing um, family of uh, Mexican immigrants, Mexican Americans, who um, were just incredibly dynamic people who be, were real, real pillars of the Mexican American community. They'll come up later in some of the stuff that we're going to show you. Um, but this is just this wonderful, vibrant shot of, of the women of the Martinez family standing in front of St. Kevin's Church in South Deering, one of the neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, this stuff is all mixed in with other things uh, that some people might consider to be, um, uh, you know, trash and some people might consider to be amazing. Um, but what, what really makes these things amazing are the stories that connect to them and the stories that people tell about them. Um, you know, they could be a story that are, that's connected to the object directly. Um, it could be the story of, of how and why it was donated uh, and who donated it. Um, you know, and it could be a story about how one particular object in the museum is connected to other objects in the museum. All of those are stories that we are interested in exploring with this site. Um, you know, so, so one of the chief goals of the site is to find ways to connect the objects in the archive with the stories that they tell. Uh, so so it's, it is an online archive first, it's an archive of digital objects, uh, but what really makes the objects powerful are these stories that we try to tease out. And um, as you'll see, there are sort of several strategies or techniques we've attempted uh, to tell stories with these objects and to connect the archive itself quite literally with the objects and the stories that are, are behind them. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is that as Chris mentioned, this is um, one phase of a multi-year uh, multimedia project, which we've called the Exit Zero Project. And this idea, this technique, or this um, approach to storytelling comes really out of something that we've been very passionate about for a long time. Uh, the Exit Zero Project, uh, as Vivek mentioned at the beginning, uh, encompasses a book that Chris wrote. Um, it encompasses a documentary film that I directed and Chris and I co-produced. Uh, the documentary film, in particular, uh, well, both both the book and the film uh, approach this trauma of deindustrialization that that happened in Southeast Chicago, uh, beginning in the 1980s, uh, through the lens or through the eyes of Chris's family. Uh, it is really a, a portrait of uh, Chris's father, who was a mill worker who lost his job in a very very traumatic way in the early 80s, uh, as well as her mother, as well as her grandfather. Who also worked in the mill. Um, there were several generations of mill workers in her family, um, and of Chris herself, as as uh, a daughter growing up in this really tumultuous time. And uh, that we found this to be a really powerful way of telling stories to sort of take the very particular lived experiences of people 
uh, and then sort of you know connect those up to these sort of larger social and political political forces, but to really try not to stray too far from the experience. But the 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 challenge or the downside is that you know you've got the palette you have to work with. You have the people you have to work with. Uh, Chris's family's experiences are their experiences. And so if we wanted to talk about other communities uh, in the neighborhood, uh, African-American, Mexican-American, um, other experiences, other kinds of experiences, we don't really have a window into doing that if we're sort of stay, staying with her family. And what was really exciting was sort of that moment when we realized that the museum was that window into a broader community and that we could sort of try to apply some of the same techniques or some of the same things we were doing in the movie to this broader archive. And so, so you know, there, there, are the, there is this sort of twofold, um, uh, twofold goal or this twofold challenge. One being just, make, you know, organize, digitize and make these objects available because some of them are amazing and really, really incredible. And there's almost no way to, to view them because it's this tiny room that you saw. Uh, but secondly, to find the stories within the objects or behind the objects or between the objects and connect those stories to these larger experiences, the experience of immigration, the experience of racism, the experience of deindustrialization. And so this site, which Jeff is gonna introduce to you, is an attempt to uh, do both of those things. Um, so Jeff, I'll stop sharing and you can take over. Thank you, Doki. All right, so this is the home page. Uh, so as, as mentioned, um, you know, from the start of this project, uh, you know, our team discussed that, that need for that, this strong relationship between archive, uh, you know, this archive of objects and storytelling, right? There's kind of like, we wanted to really have a strong connection between those two things. Uh, and it was definitely, uh, from the beginning, there was this desire to create uh, these kind of cinematic immersive uh, stories that incorporate the, uh, the items from the archive, um, which we ended up, uh, we ended up calling these uh, storylines. Uh, but so at the same time, just in terms of like the structure of this, as I'm, as I'm kind of going to go through the homepage a little bit, uh, we were also aware that this website actually um, would partly function as like a primary website for the museum itself uh, and their archive. Um, so within this kind of larger archive and storytelling project umbrella that we've created, uh, which also obviously includes the Exit Zero initiative. Um, so we did have a little bit of a challenging, uh, you know, kind of like a brand challenge to kind of uh, overcome a little bit, but uh, ultimately we decided to uh, kind of, the way in was kind of introducing this larger archive and storytelling uh, project umbrella on the homepage. Uh, and then ultimately have the digital archive, which is essentially the kind of like the home base for the museum uh, and these storylines that are stories created using, you know, items from the museum as their kind of own independent sections. Uh, so you'll see, you know, in the beginning here, it's more, you know, kind of introduced with a concept of, uh, you know, the idea of saving objects and stories we tell about them, uh, and also bringing up the idea of, you know, who tells, uh, who's in charge of history, and, all, and, and, and obviously the importance of everyday objects and kind of giving some insight into uh, this uh, community, this former industrial region. Um, and kind of, you know, and asking, as Christine had mentioned earlier, you know, whether, kind of asking the question of whether some conversations can be sparked from these, from these objects, uh, you know, and across generations and groups and regions. Uh, so kind of asking some questions, kind of sparking some curiosity, uh, but, you know, ultimately we've kind of uh, just kind of, the site has kind of two main sections in a sense, it's, kind of, it's the archive, so it's like the objects we save, uh, and this is kind of a way into that. Uh, and then the stories we tell, so that's the storylines kind of side of the website. And this, as you can, that's uh, Mary Flores, she's one of the uh, residents that we feature in one of the stories. The rest of the homepage is more pretty standard in terms of, you know, contact and, and footer. Um, oops. So, you know, even though they kind of, uh, the storylines and the archive uh, kind of exist independently on the site. They do speak to one another, which we will show. Um, 
uh, and also the archive itself does do a little bit of work and kind of uh, pushes itself a little bit to do a little bit more storytelling than the typical archive, which uh, you know Christine will talk about uh, further. Uh, but I do, uh, I'm going to jump into the archive a little bit. I'm not going to get into the details just yet. Uh, Christine's going to kind of take over, but um, just in regards to uh, structure, you know, one thing that, uh, you know, Christine mentioned earlier was that online archives tend to be, you know, kind of off-putting uh, to a lot of users the way they're structured because they can be kind of overwhelming in their, the broad categorization that they use uh, or like, you know, just kind of hitting with like a large search bar and they just kind of assume that you as a user that you know what you're looking for, you know, or um, they assume that you're gonna be like a researcher or, or a scholar who kind of uh, already has something in mind when you come to the site. So, you know, one of the challenges is we definitely still wanted to accommodate that type of user, but we also wanted to, uh, you know, consider other ways in uh, to the content. Uh, so that's something that Christine will kind of get into further detail about. But I'll kind of jump in. So like right off the bat, you can see, you know, we have obviously our standard, uh, about pages, you know, so just kind of like about the community, about the project, but also about the society and museum as well. Uh, so again, there's kind of like multiple kind of components to this larger project. Uh, for those that kind of just want to jump right to the archive, we want to have an easy access to browse option. So I will uh, jump into that in a second. So this is kind of like, as I was saying, like kind of the home base for the museum itself. This is almost like their homepage, uh, kind of like their, their website in a sense. Um, and uh, Christine will talk about the, as we scroll down, some of the uh, additions that we kind of added to it. But, you know, we really didn't want to just hit with the, you know, the kind of large uh, search bar and kind of, and again, like those kinds of like overwhelming uh, database term, terms and things like that. It's more, um, we wanted to kind of introduce you to it, give you the option to quickly browse, but then also potentially, uh, you know, uh, learn about what's in this collection for someone who has zero familiarity with it, uh, you know, upon visiting. So I'll just show um, the archive. I'm not gonna dive too deep, but if I were to jump into browse, So this is, so, you know, one of the um, challenges with this was that, you know, we had to consider our kind of the scope and limitations being this, you know, being an independent team and trying to, we couldn't really necessarily reinvent the online archive, but, uh, and just building an online archive itself is quite a beast to, you know, to take on. But we figured uh, what we could do is kind of build on top of it a little bit and entertain some kind of tweaks and additions that would make this do a little bit more uh, and kind of speak to what was mentioned earlier about trying to tease out the kind of story aspects of these objects. Uh, so this is more the kind of, you know, kind of conventional foundation of the archive itself. Uh, as you can see, there's close to a thousand objects entered uh, to date which required an enormous amount of work from all of us. <laughs> but um, definitely uh, Chris, Christine and the archivists, a lot of work uh, putting these together. Uh, we chose to, there's just a, right now there's a tab on the side uh, that allows you to filter by different criteria. Uh, there also will be, we do have a search bar that's programmed that uh, is hidden uh, currently only because we have to do more work on the kind of metadata side and keywording uh, side of things to make that search bar really function at its full capacity. Uh, so there will be a search bar here, but we intentionally kind of put it off to the side and want to hit, you know, didn't want to hit you with that first as like the, uh, the main way in. Uh, but uh, currently in this development version, you know, you can filter by various themes. And theme, themes, we also have, you know, I have, have sub-themes as well. So you can get pretty specific in terms of the kind of topics uh, you want to dive into. Uh, also time periods. 
organized by neighborhoods, uh, ethnicity and race, and also media type. Um, so, so just uh, one thing to also keep in mind that we were thinking about when building this was that this is something that um, is ultimately going to be kind of passed to the museum volunteers. We have to think about long-term maintenance and also them kind of using this as a tool. Uh, so you, uh, you know, you also don't want to make this something that they can't navigate themselves and can't also uh, keep up themselves. Uh, so uh, this is. So the strategy was to kind of incorporate some additions to the common archive, um, you know, and also, and also knowing that, you know, as we considered different ideas on how to handle the archive content, that also kind of uh, creates new work for either ourselves or the museum volunteers, you know, which, uh, you know, Christine can talk about a little bit more in terms of some of the things that we came up with. Uh, they definitely help bring out some of the story elements of, these, of this collection, of this archive, but it does require, you know, additional research to be done, additional work to be done, and, and like uh, content to be created and generated uh, to be added. So we kind of approach this as like a little bit of like a, you know, stepping this thing forward kind of a little bit of a time at a time and kind of trying out a few things uh, and things that we can kind of test, get some responses uh, from, uh, and kind of see what's even feasible uh, in terms of like the kind of workload that we're uh, potentially promising. Um, so yeah, so we feel like that was kind of the smartest way to approach it creatively and structurally. Um, but, uh, but Chris, um, I'll pass it on to you. She'll get into the details of some of the kind of additions that we added to it. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Here, let me. Sorry, can everyone see that? Yep. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so just in, um, in relation to this question of, um, in relation to this question of how to deal with gaps and silences in the collection, which I talked a little bit about earlier. Um, so how to deal with this. And as I, I um, raised the question um, about, you know, for example, um, since there are fewer materials on African-Americans, um, particularly in terms of, you know, sort of community life, um, how do we um, highlight those those materials more um, in the collection? So, you know, if there's a preponderance, you know, if there's more on, say, Eastern Europeans, how do we make sure that that stuff doesn't get kind of lost, um, you know, lost in the sea of other things? Um, and so one of the, the ways we try to address this in the archive, um, oops, sorry, I'm going to go to future curations. Uh, back to the future curations list. Um, so one of the ways we try to address this is by creating um, what we call to um, call this featured curations. We have 13 of these. So basically curating on certain topics, um, things that were key to life in Southeast Chicago, uh, but there might be fewer items on those things in, um, um, in the museum, uh, but they're things that we think people would be interested in. Um, and so we created these um, featured curations. Um, this one here is on Black Experience in the Mills. Um, we have another one on women at work. I mean, one of the things that often happens in industrial communities, because there's a lot of focus, say, on steel labor, um, it tends to focus on men's work um, and um, doesn't acknowledge as much. There were some women who did work in the mills, um, both during World War II and then beginning in the 1970s. Um, but there was other work that women did both in the mills um, and offices, um, for example, here, or in other kinds of work. So we have a featured curation on women at work, so that kind of doesn't get lost. Um, we have one on, on the, cradle to the, grave, the cradle to the grave, um, thinking about sort of the life course um, for many people in the area um, and trying to curate some objects that relate to that. Again, some of these are oral histories, some of them are objects, a lot of things are photos. Um, we have one on uh, union life, we have one on danger in the mills. It, the mills were quite dangerous, um, as I think many people probably know. Um, there's one on just having fun. There's a lot of material on, on um, just sports and popular culture and 
Um, you know, so we wanted to make sure that that had um, um, had a place, um, a key place on the site as well, um, because this was historically a largely immigrant community um, in a lot of ways. So we wanted to kind of pull some of the, the key materials around that up towards the front as well. So anyway, so we have 13 different uh, featured curations. Um, and that's one of the ways then to try to kind of both um, create ways for people to be able to approach this site, um, but also to make sure that certain kinds of materials weren't getting kind of lost, um, um, getting lost overall. Uh, and to give you, so here, um, for example, um, since again, we have, we have relatively little material um, on um, African-American home life, we wanted to make sure that we prominently emphasize this one. These are the home movies of a family called the Elkins family. Um, and it's quite telling. So this object in the back story, um, which I'll get to in a minute what that is, but we have these um, descriptions of the objects. Um, again, for a lot of African-American steel workers, because of housing discrimination, they didn't actually live within Southeast Chicago. So for example, this family, Robert Elkins, um, was the first African-American boilermaker at US Steel Southworks. Um, but his family lived actually in a housing project in Bronzeville in another section um, of Chicago, again, because of housing discrimination. So this is actually home movies from there. So we try to use the, the kind of stories around the particular objects to talk about the issue then of say housing, um, housing discrimination, for example. Um, and then what happened then with a lot of the housing developments in Chicago, they, when they changed their, um, their standards for um, how much money you can make and still live in them, a lot of African-American steel workers got kicked out of housing developments. And so then they had to find housing elsewhere, which was, um, you know, again, very difficult for them. So housing becomes, becomes a real kind of question. So we try to use this object of the home movies as a way to talk about those kinds of questions. Um, so, and let me just go back to, um, Sorry. Actually, I'll just, I'll just do it this way. So we have um, featured curations um, is again, a, a way to kind of approach um, this collection for um, users. We also have at the very top something called featured items. Um, and so these featured items, you know, one of the questions then too is when you have um, certain items, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to a particular item, um, which is quite an amazing one. This one, for example, um, that's particularly um, that we really want users to focus on, say, how to again not to get have it gets lost in the shuffle. So we so the featured items are just rotating items that we want to highlight um, for users at various points. And this um, this one here was a World War One diary. Um, and again, it's another example of sort of things being lost in the museum. There was a note in the record that there was a World War One diary in Polish, but nobody could find it. Um, and at some point, just like a year or so ago, somebody pulled open another file cabinet and they found um, this World War I diary um, um, in the bottom of it. Um, and so it's half written in Polish, half written in English. It's a really interesting piece. This guy actually, he was a Polish American immigrant who actually joined the Polish army um, during World War I. Um, the US allowed Polish Americans to join the Polish army and then they trained in Canada and actually got sent to France to fight. Um, but anyway, so it's half in Polish, it's half in English. We had to find somebody who could translate it, which was hard because a lot of it's archaic Polish. Um, but it's interesting too, this guy was also um, interested in poetry. So there's snippets of poetry and kind of drinking songs in Polish, um, but also it appears to be some poetry that he himself wrote. Um, so we had this translated um, and, you know, and again, we can tell through the archival donations um, this guy had worked in the packing houses and he married um, a Polish young woman whose family all worked in the steel mills and he came to live in the steel mill area. Um, and this was later donated by a family member. Um, so anyway, so we could use these featured items. There's also another one um, about, um, there, there was a midwife, a Croatian midwife um, who had um, uh, her midwife records going back from um, the 1910s and 1920s all written in Croatian. Um, so anyway, so we're using the featured items and the featured curations as a way to draw attention to get why. Um, and sorry. Um, so there's also um, an idea of story pass, which I think we're we're going to kind of hold off on thinking about that now until a bit later. Um, but another major way again.
stories in different kinds of ways is something called um, the storylines, um, which Jeff and Chris are going to talk about. But actually, there's, sorry, there's one thing that I've forgotten to show, which I meant to, my apologies. Oops, sorry. Um, I just wanted to quickly show um, something that we refer to as backstories. Let me find an example. Um, so, you know, again, how to um, kind of approach these objects in a different way. So this was an ID badge um, from U.S. Steel Southworks. Um, and so this woman, Pascuala Martinez, she's the mother of actually the, the five young women in that photo that Chris showed earlier. Um, and so when, when we're, we're giving descriptions of these things, what we're trying to do then is write up what we're referring to as backstories. Um, so it's, we're trying to have it be a bit more than the usual kind of context that's given and try to have it be a little more personal. Um, partly it depends on what we have in oral histories, but basically we've been taking oral histories, other information in the archives, doing research on Ancestry.com, um, some, sometimes secondary literature. Also, we've been going to people in the community. The museum has a Facebook page with about 6,000 people. So for particular items, you know, we'll post it on the Facebook page and like, does anybody know this person? Do you know anything about this kind of object or what's being depicted? Um, and we're getting information back and we're kind of creating these little kind of, some, are, um, some of these backstories are um, quite long, others are relatively short, um, but we, we try to link it up um, through the ways people talked about um, uh, um, or reference the objects, which are also often through families um, and family connections. So this is a quite, um, um, simple one. Um, and here, Kolosinski Markovich, um, who is a woman who worked during World War II, also in the steel mills. Um, so again, we're trying to use these backstories as a way to talk about the objects and the donors. And you didn't really see that in these two examples, but for in, in cases where we have oral histories, we're, we're trying to pull directly um, comment, comments from the oral histories themselves or stories um, that people told um, and actually pull those stories and, and um, quotations from the oral histories into the discussion of the objects themselves. Um, okay, so I think maybe I'll hand it over to Chris and Jeff here for um, discussion then about the storylines. Okay, thanks. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, so to this point, um, you know, as Jeff mentioned, uh, the site is really divided into two sections. There's the archive, which is um, the objects we save. That's kind of how we were describing that. And then there's the stories we tell. And all of the things that Chris has been talking about so far are all part of the archive, part of the art, the objects we save, quote unquote. Uh, so those are a number of strategies for telling those stories and connect, making those connections that I, I was talking about before. Um, but one of the, the chief ways that we're, we're attempting to do that is in the other part of the website, uh, the stories we tell. And this is where we're uh, putting together what we call storylines, which are basically broader, more sweeping, or sort of uh, more significant stories uh, that are told entirely with objects from the archive. And to date, we've completed one, and we're in the middle of doing the second. Um, the first one, which Jeff and I are going to just talk about very, very quickly, is called Mexican American Journey. And it's about the um, Mexican American experience over, you know, a century essentially, uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, it ties obviously to other immigrant experiences. There are a lot of commonalities, but there are also a lot of things that are very different about about the Mexican American journey. Um, so each of these um, each of these stories uh, begins with an object, and um, in this case, the object is uh, this display of dog tags, uh, replica dog tags. These are the dog tags that belong to uh, the young men who died in Vietnam from the Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish, the uh, local Catholic parish that was primarily Mexican American. Um, and in fact, more young men from that parish were killed in Vietnam than from any other parish in the country. So they suffered very, very heavily during the Vietnam War. 
And this object, which is part of the museum collection, becomes a springboard for our uh, attempt to explore this, this uh, Mexican-American experience over many generations. Um, so we, we uh, introduce the object, we learn a tiny bit about it, uh, and then uh, the first thing that we do in each of these stories is we meet someone who um, has a connection to the object. It might be the creator, it might be someone who has a, a very significant story that relates to the object. In this case, it's not the creator, it's Mary Flores, um, who is a, a woman whose brother uh, was killed in Vietnam. And in fact, one of these dog tags is his. So um, we start with a, a very short video of Mary, which I'll, I'll see if it will play. I knew all the young men that passed away at Our Lady of Guadalupe. Even Father Maloney, he said, he says, I've never seen so many of a young men from a parish die. Yeah. But my brother was the first one that was killed and it's him right there. They all from our neighborhood, They're all from South Chicago. My name is Mary E. Flores, and I've been in Chicago since 1949. When I first came to Chicago, I didn't like it because I'm from Oklahoma, and uh, my father used to be a coal miner, and he lost his job. We came here, and all the steel mills were uh, going then, and the coke plant and everything, it was so ugly, and you see all that graphite flying around. And I told my mother, I don't like the city. I like the, being on a farm instead, you know? And she said, she told me, oh, you're crazy. There were 17 of us. I was second to the oldest. I remember I used to carry the kids on my hip and do their diapers and all of that and hang clothes and take them down and chase after the kids. That's my brother, Tony. He was the oldest and now he was killing Korea at the age of 17. Joseph was one of my younger brothers and then he went into Vietnam and, uh, and then he was killed in January, 1966. Oh my God, my mother, she, she, she was beside herself because she had already lost one son in Korea, now the second one. She wasn't herself anymore after that. So here we give them birth and they're taken away and they don't come back. So, so we got a lot, of, a lot of military family. Three of them didn't make it, so, you know, they wanted to fight for our country, so they did. It's just something that they're proud, that they're proud to be an American, you know. So from here, we broaden out to the community. And this is a mural that's painted on the wall of a building right by the church. And the church is really the center of the community. You can see the, the spire. Um, so, so we move out from there to, um, and I'm not going to go through painstakingly, um, but we, we move to, to tell this story about Mexican-American immigration that uh, attempts to sort of get at uh, you know, uh, the place of uh, the Mexican-American community, Mexican, Mexican immigrants in America. And uh, racism, the sense of, of patriotism, the sense of belonging or not belonging uh, over, as I said, over 100 years. And all of the objects in the story are from the collection. And you can always actually find them in the collection with this tab here. So uh, if I click this, I would go to the archive entry of this particular drawing. Um, so we have um, all sorts of objects here. We have, uh, you know, linking text. We try to do it only when needed, uh, but obviously we're trying to, to, um, to sort of connect, make connections sometimes. Uh, hundreds of oral histories. There are hundreds of oral histories in, in the museum. And these uh, storylines draw very heavily on oral histories. Um, so Jeff, do you want to go look at or talk about any particular part of this? Um, yeah, no, I think I mean like you covered a lot of it. We really are. We're just trying to kind of create a, a nice, um, you know, thoughtful flow. Uh, you know, we kind of obviously you had to kind of work through a story uh, kind of outlining process, and then also considering a lot of the media. As, as Chris mentioned, there's so much to pull from, and uh, you know, Christine was trying to kind of distill a lot of what, what is there. And then we had to kind of, and then, you know, let's try and put this into, um, you know, a story with, with an arc that can, that we could, we actually had like visual media and things that we could make use of, but we also, you know, we had a sound designer, uh, Billy Raznick, who 
uh, he you know pulled from actual videos from the archive as well. Like at one point, we have some parade sounds, and he got that from a Mexican American, uh, Mexican -American parade that was in the archive that we were able to use for uh, some of the atmospheric uh, soundscapes. This is Our Lady of Guadalupe. This is the church that I talked about at the beginning, and we're hearing a service in the church. Right, so it's like an actual church service that was recorded uh, by someone uh, on the ground there. Uh, we weren't able to travel there um, ourselves, uh, so we ended up hiring someone who was local to record that uh, sermon there. So, so yes, it's kind of, you know, it's a mixture of uh, mostly driven by materials from the museum, but then kind of complemented by some uh, original text and, and sound design and some original, you know, some video work and some other pieces of media. These are of, the Martinez yeah. sisters. Um, I showed the photo of the Martinez sisters early. So this is a really, really great, rich oral history that they, that they did quite a few years ago that's part of the collection. So anyway, so the story, you know, we, uh, again, we're not gonna sort of go, go through it point by point, but um, it, goes, it goes through this sort of long journey of, of, of this community and, and the sort of moments when they flourished and the moments when they faced all sorts of challenges. Um, and then at the end, we end with Mary Flores again. Um, I don't know if I'll show that video or not. Um, it might be, it'll take too long. Um, One thing I'd show, Chris, is like if you, if you open the menu, uh, you get a chance to open the menu yet. No, the, uh, oh, yeah. the yes. item menu, yeah. No, but you can cl close that menu, the, the tab. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. right, right. So this is, um, this is a, again, a very important part because as I said, you know, we want to link these stories with the archive itself. So here you can see you know, these are the, the objects that make it up. These are the ones that we've already experienced. And then you actually see, you know, they're grayed out right now because we haven't gotten to them yet. But those are objects to come in the, in the story. So you can jump back to, you know, any of these pictures, any of these oral histories or other objects. And if you click, I mean, you should click on view, view item in archive. And you can just show that it, yeah. You know, we'll launch, it will go to that item in the archive, right? So we're kind of allowing the user to decide whether or not they want to deep dive into any of those items and spend time with it in the archive before returning back to the story. Right, but, and in, you know, in, in the archive, there might be a backstory. There might be some other uh, element that, you know, Chris has already talked about. Um, so that's, this is the one that we've completed. Um, we have three more that we're working on. And one of them, uh, the next one that we're working on that we have roughed out is about um, a very, very important event that happened in labor history in the area, uh, the Memorial Day Massacre that occurred in 1937, on Memorial Day when um, 10 steel, striking steel workers were, were shot and killed during a, a peaceful protest, uh, during what was essentially called a police riot at the time. Um, they were just gunned down by the police. Uh, so we don't have uh, a lot to show you, but we do have the opening video um, and I think maybe we can end with that. The, um, the object that everything springs out of, this is a really, really amazing object. It's a um, scrapbook uh, that was put together by a young woman whose uh, fiance, soon to be husband, was one of the strikers. And you know, uh, people who grew up in the Midwest may remember their moms, grandmas, great grandmas making scrapbooks. Often they're about weddings or birth, you know, birthdays or funerals or big life events, christenings. This one is a scrapbook about a massacre, and um, it's a really, really powerful object. So, Jeff, do you, do, should we just show the Mike Borzon video and then kind of end there? Sure. Um, so, you, if you have that here, I'll stop sharing. Okay. So, this is just kind of like a, a rough uh, early pass, so it actually looks a little different than the Mexican American story, even though it's going to follow the same format. Uh, skip through the text here, but same idea, and then introducing a starting with objects. So in this case, it's the scrapbook, uh, and then kind of transitioning to a resident that has some kind of personal connection to that object. So in this case, it's Mike Borzon, whose mother made the scrapbook. And we'll jump into his video. Um, actually, you know what? I'll just do a we'll make sure I had the uh, computer sound here. Okay. 
Yeah, my mom kept a good book. Hmm. Sad day, sad day. This is where I grew up as a kid. It's on uh, 117th in Buffalo. This dirt road still looks the same as it did when I was growing up here. I had a pear tree right here. <laughs> and uh, the steel mill was right there. When we lived here, my dad would walk to work. There used to be a brick factory over there. But I guess when the 1937 strike hit, this was all prairie, except for the few houses that were here. And from what I remember from that day is what my mom and dad told me. They were pickling the steel mill. All my family was here. My mom, my dad, my uncles, they were all here because they wanted to form a union. And back in them days, you know, they had no rights as, as workers. And then all the, as my dad would say, the bulls come running down the hill with their nightsticks, shooting people, beating people. And uh, they say it got pretty violent. They, they seen uh, many of their friends getting hit with the billy clubs, seen a couple of the people that died falling next to them. That was 1937, Memorial Day. Yeah, all this, all this happened right in here. So that's the field where, where the massacre actually occurred, which was right next to uh, his mom's house when, when she was growing up. Um, so Chris, do you wanna just kind of wrap up for a couple minutes and then we can do questions? Um, yeah, I mean, just to kind of leave time, because we don't have a lot of time, I think um, it'd be best, I think, to kind of just jump into the Q&A. Um, but just to just quickly, um, you know, a final thought, you know, again, this whole project has been very collaborative um, in a lot of ways um, and built on interaction with the community. In the website itself, there's not a lot of space for people to like say add new stories or other things, not because we didn't want to have that, but because the people, the volunteers at the museum were, were afraid of being overwhelmed with stuff and work. Um, and they already have this Facebook group that has like 6,000 people. So they're asking us to send the traffic of people who want to talk or donate things over to the, the existing Facebook page that's already there. Um, but in other ways, you know, I mean, again, it's been collaborative from, you know, in terms of, you know, who donated the stuff, um, how it's built on the museum and the community itself, you know, going back to folks in the community to talk about what these objects mean to them, um, um, you know, pulling on their knowledge about these materials for our backstories and other materials. Um, and, and you know, the plan for the future, we're working right now on a study guide for teachers in the area and others. And the whole idea, again, is to spark community conversations, um, right? So this is meant to, in some ways, be, again, a, you know, a prompt for conversation back and forth, um, both within the area and also with people um, and other regions as well. Um, so that's, you know, kind of the next stage after we have um, the official launch and get the stuff finished is the next stage is, again, getting back to collaborative work with the community, kind of using this tool to spark a range of conversations. So, um, you know, we don't exactly know where that's going to go yet, but, um, but, but that's, the, that's the plan. And we've done that with the Exit Zero book and film, um, where we have had a lot of community screenings of the Exit Zero film. And they've been very powerful in some ways because often people would kind of get up and kind of witness their own family's experiences of deindustrialization. Um, so we're hoping that this one, again, because it's kind of so spread out, a range of different families and their stories and individuals in different neighborhoods talking about what their experiences were coming in some cases from very different positions, um, using that as a, you know, kind of prompts, again, to be people, getting people to reflect on their own history. Um, so anyway, so, um, please, let's open it up for a conversation and apologies for um, not having more time for the Q&A because we'd really love to hear what you all um, are thinking. Thank you so much. Um, I usually jump in and ask a question taking advantage of my, <laughs> my status as host, but I'm not going to do that. I do have questions, but I wanted to just open it up. Um, more broadly to everyone. Laura. I want to thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm, I'm actually from Wisconsin, and so uh, this just felt 
it felt close to me and just kind of my experiences also growing up in, in around the communities, um, some, some similar to this. So um, the design of the website just looks elegant and accessible and I really appreciate uh, the measures you took to make it that way. Um, my question for you, which you somewhat answered already, um, is that it sounds like you're designing tools for teachers to use, um, but have you are seen this being used pedagogically already? Has the community already taken it in certain ways um, besides showing the film taken this and, and already begun to use it as a teaching tool? Um, because I just think it's incredible. And I'm kind of curious to see what they've already come up with if they have. Um, we're working on the study guide right now and in conversation with some community leaders about you know, interfacing with teachers in the public schools and how we might want to use this as a, a disseminate it within the community. Also through, you know, a lot of people, one of the things that's tough about this, a lot of people in the area have phones and the archive itself works well on phones. The storylines um, are very data intensive. Um, so that's going to be an issue for people who don't have laptops. So we really want to try to get it out through the community, through the schools then, for where, for example, where people would have more access to laptops or the local public um, libraries, which a lot of people go rely on those heavily to be able to access computers. So trying to do kind of um, community viewing events at the library, you know, both kind of community events and then having people kind of give their feedback on stuff. Um, so um, it, that's all still it's sort of in process yet. So we don't fully know yet exactly um, how it's going to be taken up, but we're, we're hopeful that um, people will make real use of it. Amber. Hi. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's really impressive, uh, all the work that you have been doing uh, in the archive. And I was wondering if you have considered expanding the archive to, and bring it to the present. You know, like I, I saw that you were interviewing people, but then I was wondering if those people also have stories, right? And also have like important objects. So if you start like collecting those and expanding the story, it could, create like a broader picture of the whole town. I know it's a lot of work, but I guess I was just wondering. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if, um, if Chris has other thoughts on this as well, but the other two storylines that we want to do, one is about the impact of deindustrialization, the loss of the steel industry on the community. And the last one is on environmental activism. Um, there's a lot of industrial pollution. So the environmental activism story goes up into the contemporary period. So like you see, you see where that, um, the, the Memorial Day Massacre strike happened. That's now a brownfield. That's toxic. There's a lot of space in Southeast Chicago that's just toxic, empty brownfield. Um, so community environmental activists um, in the area. So, so that's a storyline that goes up to the current moment. Um, so, and we do want this become to become a site where it's both about the past, but using the past as a way, again, to connect generations and think about the future. What do you, what's the future for old industrial communities like this? Um, so we would love to think that, you know, about, you know, some of the stuff, you know, you're suggesting about, you know, if, you know, again, and we have to work with the community volunteers because they don't want to be overwhelmed. So how to do it in a way where you can take in more, you know, maybe if some people end up volunteering where we can kind of think about creating other kinds of ways then to access newer material and attach it to the site. Um, so that's something, um, you know, we'd like to think about moving forward. I don't know if Chris or Jeff, if you had other. Um, well, I, was, I would just say, yeah, so I was the environmental activism story, that, that storyline, the, um, the object that it comes out of is a jar of pet coke. Pet coke is a toxic material that's left over from oil refining, uh, tar sand oil refining. And, and so that was collected a couple of years ago by a, a bunch of relatively young activists. A lot of them are moms who have children who live in the community who, who become very, very adamantly opposed to some of the more recent, you know, there's this long history of toxic pollution in the area, but it's the more recent sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, levels of it. So, so yeah, we, we are very interested in bringing it into the contemporary period, but it is, a, a, it's a, an enormous amount of work and it's all volunteered, you know, the museum is all volunteer. So, um, you know, we are, are assisting in the organizing and, and so on of the collection. The collection remains the communities. 
Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions in, in chat. Um, so I'll go to, to those for a moment. Um, so from, from Greg, uh, curious about how you hope members of the community use the online project to share their oral stories with family and friends as they would if sitting on a couch while thumbing through an old family scrapbook photo album. How do you hope they recreate that shared social experience? Chris, do you want to tackle that one or? or do um, you, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. You know, one of the one of the issues that we have right now, which, you know, is a huge, you know, it's a huge developmental lift is the fact that um, the storylines don't work particularly well on phones. They're, they're quite glitchy. Um, so the archive, as Chris said, is, is better. Uh, you know, I think I, I would like to think that, you know, people got huddle around a laptop. Uh, we know that in practice that doesn't always happen. Um, phones are really kind of the center of social, the social world for a lot of people. And it's more virtual. It's not like sitting on the couch together necessarily, although, although our son does that with his friends. Um, so, you know, I can very easily imagine people sharing this on a phone, uh, either when they're in the same space or in different spaces. Uh, the laptop, which of course, as MIT people, we all have, uh, is less of a you know common item. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say though, I mean, we are looking to have this work on uh, tablets. It's more just like for the storyline part, right? The archive itself is definitely mobile friendly. Yeah, right. Storyline, uh, the thing is, it's kind of like uh, you're doing a disservice to users if you expect them to download all that media on their data plan uh, on a phone. You, you could blast someone's data plan pretty quickly. So, but I mean, if you're on Wi-Fi with a tablet, that is certainly a potential option. So that, that could be more conducive to what you're describing. And something else we had talked about, but again, we were kind of overwhelmed with how much work it would take, <laughs> but would still be a great idea, is if you could put the GPS coordinates in for the various objects, and yeah, you because know, there's a lot of old photos or particular places, because then I could definitely see a lot of people with their phones walking around to various parts in the neighborhood that might have been like, you know, because like the site, we didn't show this, but at the end of the, the Mexican American journey story, you go back to the Southworks, which was the biggest mill in that area, which is now all brownfield. And so you actually, at the ruins of the brownfield, they actually had a recent um, Day of the Dead event um, where um, Mexican Americans in the community were honoring their ancestors who had worked in, in the museum. So that's pretty powerful there at the ruins. So you could see people with their phones at ruins like that, looking up the images of the time period. Um, but again, you know, getting all the GPS data and setting that up, it's, you know, time and money. Um, so we have lots of things we'd love to do if we had. And, and just one last, and <laughs> um, one last point about it. So because of deindustrialization and the economic challenges that the area has faced for, you know, the last more than 20 years, uh, there's been kind of a diaspora of, of people. You know, a lot of people have moved away, but who still feel really tightly connected to the area. So there, as Chris mentioned, I think there's a really strong Facebook presence that the museum has, a very, very lively Facebook group. People are always commenting, always sharing things. So um, I think that the archive part and hopefully the storylines as well as, you know, on tablets or, or laptops can kind of be taken up into that diaspora ecosystem so that people are kind of doing what they might do with a photo album, but doing it uh across you know great distances and i just want to say in relation to one of the other questions in the chat about relationships with other chicago-based institutions that have archives and museums so the advisory there's an advisory group for this project it includes somebody from the chicago history museum and the field museum um, so they've been fantastically helpful in all of this um, and actually with the guy um, we've been working with the Chicago History Museum, he actually has his PhD in, um, in Slavic studies. So he's volunteering to translate some of the Serbian and Croatian materials <laughs> for us, which has been, which has been fantastic. Um, so we are in connection with those folks and they actually, through the Field Museum, they're trying to create a consortium of institutions uh, across the Calumet region to bring together different kinds of archival collections. This is kind of like the biggest one, but there's a number of other kind of small historical, historical collections. And Gary, Indiana also has 
um, some industrial archives there. So trying to create a kind of a consortium of groups as well, and then hooking them up through the Field Museum and the Chicago History Museum so um, more users can find um, those spaces. Um, so we are trying to kind of connect, create those connections. Um, also folks at the um, uh, Mexican Museum of Art in, in, South, um, um, in Southwest Chicago um, as well. Hey, looking at the chat, I see that there's a question about the curation of the storylines and the creation of them. And uh, just because that's like a very uh, challenging process, I don't know if we want to say a couple of words about that. I don't know, Jeff, you, you're you're kind of always, uh, you know, like like shouldering the burden there. I don't know if you have anything to say in, uh, to answer that one. Uh, well, it's funny to be articulated the question. It sounds to me like it might be more about um, it's like choosing the materials to use and whose voices are heard. So like what, yeah, kind of the, um, the selection process, right? The media and the, and the materials that we're using. Right, which I think relates to the narrative process, broadly speaking, which is also a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's a narrative process, but I guess I'll also say it's also, um, you know, plays into like, Christine, I don't know if you wanna talk about, you know, how you're sharing this with the committee and, and you know, and various community members that are uh, be getting incorporated into these stories as well. So there, yeah. there's that part of it too. And, and just to say with as part of, um, from the beginning of the project and also as we were working on the grants for the National Endowment for the Humanities, we worked with the advisory community, which has community reps and the different volunteers from, from the, um, uh, different volunteers on the board of the museum. Um, you know, and we, we kind of talked through, in, you know, we tried to pick stuff based on what's in the museum itself, you know, so again, trying to honor the kind of categories that people had in terms of like, you know, if there's certain topics that, you know, again, the military topic, there's a ton of stuff. So as an anthropologist, that's really interesting. Why is there so much stuff on the military here? So that's been an interesting one to ponder. So we've tried to kind of honor the kind of categories around which people were donating stuff. But then another instance is we tried to, like if we knew, for example, by the time the steel mills ended, about a third of the workers were white, again, largely Eastern European, about a third were Mexican American, about a third were African American. Um, and in turn, you know, so we, you know, but again, there's, there, there's some gaps within the museum's collection itself. So in those cases where we know that is kind of reflective of the actual social life of the area, trying to make more prominent certain voices that might be getting lost um, in the stuff because we know that's historically accurate um, 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 to the place. And so that played a role as well. So we went through with the advisory committee, what is this stuff we wanna prioritize and emphasize and how do we kind of create balance in these kinds of ways, both honoring kind of what people donated and why they thought it was important, but also making sure that we're addressing gaps if gaps are there. So we went through that kind of process then of um, deciding what kind of stuff to emphasize. And then Jeff had a huge, um, influence as well as like kind of what stuff is arresting in aesthetic terms um, that we, you know, that people would, you know, enjoy looking at, which was definitely part of the process as well. If you've got 300 pictures of a steel mill, right, which, one, which ones are the exciting ones to look at? And <laughs> um, Anyway. I'm, I'm going to take another question from the Q&A. Uh, this is from Mimi, uh, who asks this, or who says, this is an awesome project. Thank you so much. Can you show an example of an entry on the back end? I don't know whether Jeff, you're set up to do that. And if not, it would it would certainly be interesting to to hear a bit about the code side of this. Back end, yeah. I mean, so this is built on WordPress. Uh, so any of you have used WordPress, it's pretty pretty standard. You know, it's customized and everything. I have our back end developer, Jared. Um, you know, I could, I mean, I could try pulling it up real quick. Um, the the storylines are very custom. That's not really anything that we have like a backend for because that's like a very tailored thing that we've been kind of creating and kind of shaping as we make them. Uh, so that's something we're just kind of building manually. Um, and it's just a, it would be a massive thing to be like making a, a platform from scratch. Uh, so we just don't have the kind of resources and, resources and capacity to do that for the storylines, but for the, archive side, uh, we definitely, you know, it's all WordPress based, so I can do quick. Jump in here. Um, 
So here's your typical, you know, WordPress dashboard. Um, we have a feature curation section. Uh, we have our, okay, here's the archive. Let's jump into there. So if I just jump into one of the individual entries, um, this is actually speaking to another piece of software called Archive Space that the museum's using to uh, kind of catalog everything in there in the archive. Uh, so the archivist Derek works very much with those records. He's like a session records in the archive. Uh, and he inputs a lot of the metadata there. And then we're actually putting in the unique ID from those records. And that's actually drawing from archive space and pulling in that data into WordPress. So we actually do have two kind of uh, databases that are speaking to each other for this project. Uh, and then we have the ability to kind of add additional metadata on top of that. Uh, and, and then you'll know, obviously articulate if it's like, if this item is a part of a feature curation, if it's a part of a storyline, we can add a call to action for the storyline that's a part of, uh, add any kind of rights information, you know, put up the thumbnail. If it's, a, if it's something we have on YouTube, it's a piece, if it's a video, we have a link to the YouTube video in the channel. Uh, and then of course, you know, all the filters and everything are these check boxes on the right hand side. So how are, how are those two integrated? The, the, the database that you're pulling from that there, is that um, custom code that you're writing manually or is there, is there some existing, um, you know, plugin or, you know, how much of it is, is sort of, you know, pushing beyond what, what WordPress allows you to do and, and kind of customizing it in a very, um, you know, line by line way. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, WordPress is pretty, pretty much a blank canvas in terms of like just a foundational framework. And then, so this is definitely customized, but, um, uh, you know, in terms of some unique, unique functionality, the fact that it is pulling, so Archive Space has an API, so that allows it to, you know, kind of, uh, make its data accessible to external uh, programs. So we're tapping into Archive Space API to draw from its data to pull into here. Uh, and then there's going to there's like an automated kind of check, uh, you know, the frequency we have yet to decide, but it might be like every week or so where, where WordPress will look back to Archive Space and see if anything has changed and then automatically make updates. Um, you know, but the main the unique relationship here is that Archive Space really would be the place where the museum would go to kind of organize their collection and keep keep tabs on it and be able to find things. Uh, and then this the WordPress and this website is more like once they decide they want to uh, feature something in the digital archive and make it more public, that's when it kind of, you know, leaps over to this website and becomes a new uh, added item to this. Because obviously we only have maybe about a thousand items on this site, but the museum itself has thousands of items. Uh, and they're not all gonna end up on this website. But, so I'd say that relationship between those two programs are pretty unique. Um, and it's definitely, this is like, you know, in terms of the combination of functions that we put here, it's very, it's very custom. Uh, we definitely made use of uh, certain pre-existing, you know, WordPress functionalities uh, or, or functions to, to make this happen. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, you know, in a nutshell, without going into crazy detail, <laughs> I'm trying to keep it pretty simple. But <laughs> Other questions from from the group. Um, well, I, um, so I'll, I'll finally ask a question. Um, and, and it sort of goes back to the, the, um, question about, um, you know, the choices that you're making in terms of the storylines. Um, it seems like the storylines are, you know, it sounds like they're quite um, labor intensive and, um, and, you know, each one, like, you know, just the one that you showed, you know, you can see how much care and thought and time went into it. Um, and so I'm wondering about, you know, over time, you know, do you see how many of the storylines do you see um, creating, and is this something that would that you see as as an ongoing project where you know every 
six months or something or every certain amount of time over the first few years you're continuing to add these stories or you know what's what's that that kind of longer term picture for the storyline aspect of the site I don't know who wants to field that one I mean, right, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. Uh, well, I would. Um, so right now we have plans for four, uh, and the four. I guess Chris mentioned them: it's the Mexican uh, American experience, it's the Memorial Day massacre, environmental uh, challenges in the area, and activism, which is a much more contemporary story, um, and then deindustrialization, which is a historical story but a little bit more recent history, 80s and 90s. Uh, they are really labor intensive and they require essentially funding. So um, the, we got a supplemental grant from another foundation to do a couple of additional ones, which is why we now have plans for four. And I think doing more is kind of a wonderful idea, but also requires, requires funding. Um, one of the things that, that, again, we wanted to do was find other ways to weave stories into the archive, which is why the backstories, which are much more, you know, much less labor intensive, the featured curations, uh, and then a third uh, sort of direction, which Jeff could talk about if, he, if we have time, uh, something we call sto um, storylines, which are, um, or I'm sorry, story paths, which, which is a little bit like a storyline, what you saw, but much lighter in terms of the, the design elements, the design work, and the, the sort of shaping of, of an arc. I don't know, Jeff, do you want to briefly describe that? Yeah, briefly. I mean, because I guess, you know, the interesting thing in, in us kind of having these kind of two sections of storylines in the archive and then being related is that um, and this idea of kind of pushing the archive a little bit in terms of its storytelling capabilities is that we were kind of coming up with things that were making it lean a little bit towards the storyline side, but not go like full on into it. They still are kind of these separate spaces. Uh, but yeah, story paths, and I know we keep using the word story in like a lot of different ways, so we might have to change the name. We're kind of worried about, you know, backstory, storylines. Story yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of different forms of story. Yeah. Uh, but with the idea behind story path is that instead of it, you know, like curations are kind of just like a, a collective group of items that kind of fit under, uh, you know, a shared theme. Um, but a story path would be kind of like you're uh, thoughtfully kind of choosing a sequence of items in the collection that might, uh, if you were to follow it in sequence, actually have some kind of an interesting arc to them. Uh, and it would almost be almost like a, like a, in my mind, it's almost like an animatic or something. It's like this kind of visual storyboard or something that you could follow. And if you, if you go from like picture to picture to picture, you can actually see this visual narrative kind of unfolding. Uh, and that's like one other way to kind of pump up the storytelling capability of the archive itself. Uh, yes. So, yeah, yeah, something entertaining. Yeah. The storylines with the complicated ones, you know, we start with essentially what's an animatic. You know, it could be a PowerPoint or a Google Doc or something. So this would be, yeah, like a stripped down version of that without, you know, designed, you know, because it would be based on a nice design, but not custom designed, I think. Um, right. With all of the, the other, you know, sound design and, and stuff that really takes a lot of the effort and energy and, and time. And it, and it kind, of, uh, kind of invites the user uh, to fill in the gaps themselves a little bit or kind of do a little bit more of the investigating themselves. Uh, you, you know, so we're just kind of providing the, the main kind of keyframes and they can kind of choose to read up more about the individual items and kind of fill in the, you know, the narrative gaps a little bit on their own. Um, so yeah. I think the whole, the whole idea is, right, so we, you have the archive. The archive is the thing. And I, mean, I, always, think of it, I always think kind of archive first, right? It's an archive. And you can explore the archive in a lot of different ways. And maybe it seems confusing that there are a lot of sort of story, sto story ways of, of exploring it. But I feel like really it's an archive. And once you get into the archive, then you can discover, oh my gosh, you know, like there's a featured curation or, you know, there's a story path. This item leads to that item. Uh, this one has a backstory. Uh, or you can go and just embrace the full on storylines as well however many of those there end up being. So, so it's an archive first, and then we're trying to make all these internal connections that supplement and enhance, and as I was saying, you know, um, bring out the stories behind the objects. Uh, re hopefully not in a confusing way where, you know, you don't really understand what you're doing, you're, you're seeing, because what you're seeing is an archive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and I just wanted to briefly say, like, in terms of, again, this has taken an enormous amount of work, I think far more than any of this of us anticipated when we got involved with it. So I just wanted to give a huge shout out to Jeff, who's done um, really extraordinary work um, in, you know, in making it look really gorgeous at the same time. Um, and also seeing Kurt Fenn up there, like Kurt helped back in the early days of thinking about this project. So thank you, thank you, Kurt. And just mentioning some other folks, like in addition, our, car, our archivist has done enormous amounts of work, again, like you know, taking the community attic and trying to get it all organized. And the director of the museum, um, who's um, a volunteer guy who's been volunteering for many years, um, you know, he, you know, like every item, we're constantly going to him and like, what do you know about this, Rob? We can't find any information. And like, just, just an extraordinary amount of work and over decades that he put into kind of preserving these, these items and making sure that they're, they're kind of around and there's information on them. So anyway, so I just wanted to give a, you know, a, again, a recognition of how much this has been an enormous team effort. Um, you, you know, and you can see why people, you know, you know you know, why there probably hasn't been a lot like this. You, 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 it's just an enormous amount of work um, to do this kind of thing. And, you know, um, any, anyway, but, you know, so it's, it's been, it's, it's, it's been great. We'll see, um, we'll see how it goes, but it is a, a huge team effort um, to do something like this. Um, so we've gone past time, but um, uh, I think there was, there was one other question from Tomas in the Q and A, um, if, if you have a moment for, for that, and it's a question about the, the platform, um, why WordPress versus other archives specific platforms like Omeka? Oh, thank you, Professor, but I think you largely responded by now, so. Okay, all right. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, I think um, I think uh, time our time is has come to an end. But um, this has been really incredible and and um, really is such a rich, rich project. Um, and you're doing such um, I don't know beautiful work with it. You know, and, you know that's both meaningful and aesthetically beautiful. So. Um, want to thank you for presenting and, and um, ask everyone else to join in, in giving your thanks, giving thanks. Thank, thank you all so much. It's been great to have a chance to talk about the project with you all. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining. All right. Take care, everyone.